Anatomy flashcards. I know that sounds really exciting, doesn't it? <laughs> but look at the size of this thing. And somebody, a previous student that I'd forgotten was nice enough to separate all the stuff that I talked about. So what's in the rubber band is uh, are flashcards for stuff for the muscles that you need to know. It's no bones, but it's muscles. So that should be helpful. And I would like to I'll put it out into the uh, student uh, study area out there so that everybody has access to it. I prefer you use it here. Okay, but you're welcome to use it. Okay. Or you, uh, if you want to make copies of it, you can do that too. Uh, now I know where, it, if it disappears, I know where to look for it. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll put that out there after class so okay. you guys can have that to use. Thank you. Any questions? Other than, other than why me? <laughs> <laughs> Um, if, you can, if you can read my line, yes. <laughs> I would suggest that that could be a scary place to be. What were the two two muscles from accident insert on the inner tubercular group? Pectoral latissimus dorsi and the pectoralis major antagonist muscles. Physiology is another thing that is kind of like anatomy. It's important to know just because it will give you insight into activities that people, physical activities that people do while they're working and the requirements for them. So it gives you better insight into your subjects once you get out into the workplace. Um, once again, the best source for this is Martini and Nat. And like I told you before, it doesn't matter what edition. And some earlier editions, I understand you can pick up really, really inexpensively. Mm -hmm. and that's what I'd do if I were you. Yeah, I got one on eBay for $6. There you go. There you go. And the new ones are upwards of 200 So don't, don't do that. Get, a, get a, a new, an old one on eBay. And there's an online version. And there's an online version. That's even better. OK. Energy. Energy is what we need to move. And physicists define as the capacity to perform work. And when we, uh, work is the applying force through distance. Types of energy, and I may have missed some, but I, I think you'll get the idea. Chemical, mechanical, heat, light, electrical, and nuclear. We obviously aren't going to be much interested here in heat, light, electrical, or nuclear. However, chemical and mechanical will be of some interest to us because we exert mechanical energy through chemical processes in our, in our muscles. And the way we do that is the breakdown of ATP, adenosine triphosphate, into ADP, adenosine diphosphate, and a byproduct of that breakdown is an organic phosphate and energy, 7 to 12 kilocalories of energy every time you break an ATP molecule into an ADP molecule. It yields energy. So this is a formula, eh? Um, it is, uh, but it's not, it's, actually, it probably does balance, but I'm not going to be real particular about the chemical formulas. Okay. Uh, I'm just interested in the process. Sure. Okay. But we have to get ATP back, because when we break it down, when we're moving, when we're using energy, generating work and exerting force, we have to get the ATP back somehow. And that's by a process called ATP resynthesis. And we have three different pathways for ATP resynthesis. Uh, one, uh, uh, there, and there are two categories, anaerobic with no oxygen, and there's two types of ATP resynthesis, the phosphatin system and the anaerobic glycolysis system. And anaerobic work uses oxygen, and that's sometimes referred to as aerobic glycolysis. The anaerobic phosphatin system breaks down um, 
uh, breaks down uh, phosphocreatine okay, into the intergranic phosphate creatine, and that breakdown yields energy. And then in the presence of that energy, you can regenerate ATP from the ADP that has been broken down for, um, for um, energy use. Uh, this is a very, very inefficient and short-term system. And I'll summarize these by showing you the, uh, the how we how we uh, cycle through using each of these three systems. And again, the the chemical formulas aren't formal chemical formulas. They're just to show you what the process looks like. You don't even have to repeat those unless that's the way you can use those to, to remember it. So this the phosphocreatine it happens to be something that we store in the muscle cell. It's um, it's a byproduct of, of our food sources phosphocreatin. And when phosphocreatin breaks down, it yields energy in an inorganic phosphate. That energy in the inorganic phosphate that it yields uh, uh, will bind, cause the, the inorganic phosphate to bind, it bind with the ATP so that we get a, a brand new ATP as a result of it, which then can be used in the, in the muscle contraction process again. Because remember, the whole point of these is is the resynthesis of, of adenosine triphosphate, the energy source for muscle. Uh, this is, a, like I said, it's a, it's a very short-term and um, uh, use use system, and it, and it depletes very quickly. Yes, James. So to read those two lines, you have phosphocreatine turns into PI plus creatine plus energy. Yeah, and then the energy from that and, and the inorganic phosphate. Inorganic phosphate and the energy plus ADP will allow the, the uh, uh, resynthesis of ATP. So if the top line adding in ADP turns into ATP. Right. Right. <clears throat> the creatine isn't particularly important. It just builds up in, in, in the muscle, but the inorganic phosphate and the energy is what is important. And that would be less energy than the 7 to 12 kcal. It's not the amount. Of uh, actually, for each breakdown, um, uh, probably, I don't know exactly what the amount of energy is for that, to be honest with you. I, I've never thought about that before. But you're right in that it would have to balance or else it wouldn't be worthwhile. Yeah. But I, I don't know how much energy that requires. OK? The other anaerobic mechanism is anaerobic glycolysis, also called the lactic acid system. And everybody knows that when lactic acid builds up in your muscles, you start to hurt. That's what causes the muscle pain. That's what causes the burn, you know, as, as, as trainers love to say, is the buildup of lactic acid in your muscles. Okay. So what you use, glycogen is stored in liver and muscle. Okay. It's a byproduct of consumption of of um, uh, a variety of foodstuffs, primarily carbohydrates. Okay? Because if you look at the, the generalized formula, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen in those proportions is a, is a generalized carbohydrate. So glycogen breaks down and yields lactic acid. And this does balance, but don't worry about it, uh, the, because it breaks down into two. Uh, each one of these breaks in half. And there's n of them, and that will yield two of those. I probably should have put an n substrate there too. But once again, it wasn't supposed to balance. It's not a chemistry class. So the glycogen yields lactic acid and energy, and that energy uh, uh, with the inorganic phosphates. This doesn't yield inorganic phosphates, but the energy that it yields with the inorganic phosphates that break off of the ATP will yield three ATPs. And this is what's important from this is that remember the last one forms a single ATP. This forms three ATPs. Okay. And that proportion is what's important. But again, other than the oxygen that's present in the, that's bound in the, in the glycogen and the carbohydrate, there is no oxygen required for this reaction. Okay. These are all anaerobic processes before we get oxygen to, the, to our system. And finally, the long-term solution to ATP resynthesis is aerobic glycolysis. Still use carbohydrates, glycogen, and oxygen. And now we get a byproduct, we look at the byproducts. Carbon dioxide, which we exhale, 
water, which was sweat out, had energy. Right? So that energy then, with enough ADP and enough inorganic phosphates, now yields 39. And that's a ratio that's important. <coughs> One ATP per reaction for the, for the uh, phosphocreatin system, three ATPs per reaction for the inter inorganic uh, um, um, anaerobic glycolysis, and to 39 for aerobic glycolysis. And that's the, that's the bottom line, that's what's important. Okay. Now let's compare the three. <clears throat> so first look at this graph. On, on the, uh, this scale is time in seconds, converted to minutes at the top, but it's the same scale. And this is the energy rate, uh, percent production. Okay. So when we first start exercising, we have this huge 100% phosphate, <coughs> but in less than 30 seconds, it falls down to about 10%. So it doesn't take us much more than 30 seconds to, uh, to exhaust the phosphocreatin in our muscle for, eight, for the purposes of ATP synthesis. As it, is, as it is dropping to about a 50% production rate, that's when our anaerobic glycolysis system is starting to peak. And, but then that, once again, trails off. And it's, again, by the time it gets to 20, we're just about a, a minute and a half. And while those are covering for the activity that we're performing, and until we can start getting oxygen to our, uh, to our system, to our tissues, that's when the where the aerobic process begins and the limits of the aerobic process, the aerobic process is only limited by conditioning. Okay. Uh, ultra marathoners can run 100 miles. Okay. And they, by conditioning, they use the anaerobic process overwhelmingly throughout the, the, the period when they're doing it. But it's only limited by conditioning of the of, of person. The phosphagin and anaerobic glycolysis systems, on the other hand, are, have internal limiting um, mechanisms. By, if they're limited by the internal uh, glycogen, by the internal phosphocreatin that we have resident in our tissues, in our muscles. Can you repeat that again, please? Um, I don't know if I can. The, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, the, uh, uh, the, anaer the aerobic glycolysis is only limited by conditioning. However, the anaerobic, both the phosphagin and the anaerobic glycolysis, is limited by the presence of those reagents, by, by, not reagents, by those uh, uh, substances in the tissue, in the muscle. Um, what this means right here is uh, it shows the capacity and the uh, rate of production for the three systems, just this middle portion right here, don't worry about its mold for, of ATP per minute. Think of it as the rate of production per minute. The anaerobic are one and 1.6. However, once the phosphagin, I mean, once I, the phosphagin is very, a very high rate. Uh, anaerobic glycolysis isn't much better than aerobic glycolysis. But anaerobic is the lowest rate of production. But the length of, uh, of time that it can be produced, the capacity, is uh, multiple times as a factor of 90. Okay, the amount that it can produce, it can produce 90 times what either the anaerobic systems can produce. And this is just a little bit more information on it, whether oxygen is required kind of already talked about that, how quick it is, and the ATP production, which is kind of covered right here. The only other thing that I want to mention off of the slide is the idea of VO2, okay. what I have in the middle there. It actually is supposed to have a dot over it. I couldn't figure out how to do it in Excel, or I mean in, in PowerPoint. And you can do it in an in, in equation, but then it would have messed up my slides so I didn't do any question. But what it's supposed to be is that it's VO2. That's the ventilatory capacity. And uh, there's two ways to measure it. There's an absolute measure in liters per minute, uh, but then there's a relative measure in liters per kilogram per minute. 
that's adjusted for the size of the person that you're testing. Um, there's a test that we'll talk about later, but I'll introduce it now, called a max VO2 test. Has anybody in here ever done a max VO2 test? Do you know, does anybody know what it is? It is a test whereby you put the subject on a bicycle or a tre usually a treadmill, and you put an apparatus over their face that's kind of like a scuba mask. And it fits something over your head and it holds this thing in front of your face and it captures everything that you inhale and exhale. So if they can tell what kind of, um, how much CO2, what kind of metabolism you're using, and uh, they can also measure the rate of ventilation in either liters per minute or liters per kilogram per minute, whichever they want. And then they keep going, and they, they speed it up, tilt it, speed it up, tilt it. There's a, there's a protocol for doing it. And you have to have a highly motivated subject to do this, because you must, to do it, a true maximum VO2, their legs have to fail. They have to fall off the treadmill. And, and that way you can actually measure what the absolute maximum is for the, for the individual uh, in their ve ventilatory capacity. Obviously, most workers aren't going to be very, very comfortable with that kind of a test. So we have, what are, uh, have ways of estimating that from sub-maximal tests. The only people that do that are uh, graduate students in ergonomics, I did one one time, and, uh, and, and athletes. Athletes like to do this sort of thing. You know, they, just, they just love to run, run themselves until they drop. Uh, it's just uh, it's built into their personality, or if you're really interested in it. But most, most workers, you're not going to get them to do that. Uh, but that's the only way to measure it directly. Otherwise, you have to estimate it. And there are a lot of methods for estimating maximum VO2. And it's a way of, uh, you, can, you can make inferences about <clears throat> about um, the type of uh, ATP resynthesis strategies they're using, about their maximum ventilatory capacity, and, um, um, and it's had a lot, a lot of metabolic uh, inferences about their, the activity. Okay, so that's energy production. Two are anaerobic, one aerobic. The anaerobic are fast, but exhaust quickly. And the aerobic are uh, slow to uh, relatively slow to uh, come into a, uh, come into effect, uh, for lack of a better term, but it's only limited by the conditioning of the individual who does it. So when we begin to exercise, we build up, and this is uh, this is our. Uh, our increase in metabolism and ventilation, we build up what's referred to as an oxygen deficit because we're doing all this anaerobic activity. That's why you start, you start to breathe heavily because you build up an oxygen deficit. You reach your maximum capacity, then you end work, but after you end work, you have to repay that oxygen deficit, what's called an oxygen debt. And that's why when you finish doing whatever it is you're doing, whether it's running five miles or you know, unloading a, a truckload of tires or whatever it is, you, have, you keep breathing for a while, keep breathing heavily for a while, and it tapers off because you have to repay the oxygen debt that you've built up at the beginning of the activity. Even when you're climbing? It doesn't matter what kind of activity. It doesn't matter what kind of activity. If the, you, you build up an oxygen debt, the, an oxygen deficit that you have to repay then when you finish the activity. Did you have a question? Yes. Yeah, the, the, the oxygen deficit, it seems like it would be called something else. There. Is it pointing to the line? Because uh, that's, that's extra, right? That's the that's extra. The oxygen point. deficit is this, is this gray area. Okay. And the debt is this gray area. So I think deficit and debt sound like the same thing. Right? They do. <laughs> I think that whoever it was, uh, sometimes they call the, the oxygen deficit, and sometimes this is called recovery oxygen, which is a little bit more explanatory. Oxygen deficit is what you think of it as what you don't get to your to your tissues when you begin exercise. Maybe that's the best way to think about it. And then the debt is what you repay them afterwards. And uh, but like I said, recovery oxygen is probably better. Uh, it varies by age and weight and it varies by a lot of things. Yeah, age, weight, gender, 
Um, uh, but primarily, uh, the most, the most single most important thing is fitness. Mm -hmm. Is the part in the middle where you're equal? That's right, where you're maintaining the um, uh, maintaining your level of activity. That's the part that varies. Well, actually, all of it's going to vary a lot, but the, the length of time that you can do that uh -huh. varies according to your uh, whether whether you're you know, sitting on your butt all the time or whether you're an ultra marathoner. Can do that for 24 hours. I can. <laughs> when you're conditioning yourself, does that mean that you're making your muscles more used to contracting or contracting, or are you creating more blood cells, or what is conditioning to make you? Uh, it's getting. Um, it's a number of different things, but primarily it's getting oxygen to your tissues at a continuous rate, so that it doesn't. So that, so that you don't build up such an oxygen deficit that you can no longer contract. Uh, that's why we measure VO2 max, because uh, what you have to do is, uh, right now, you know, if you're uh, someone who's not conditioned, they get on the treadmill and run to exhaustion and won't take long if you're not used to it. But somebody that is used to it, they can get a lot more oxygen to their tissues and therefore maintain activity longer. Uh, in addition to that, uh, what you do is you build up the contractile elements of your muscles. Uh, you can increase the number of myofibrils you increase the um, uh, the strength of the uh, of the uh, non uh, of the passive elements, tendons, fascia, and that sort of thing. You increase the actual uh, tensile strength of the, that portion of it. If you're especially if you're doing resistance training, but even if you're running, that is resistance training for your lower body at least. And so you're you're building up contractile proteins and the the uh, um, like I said, the passive components, tendons and, lig and the ligaments and, the, and the fascia. Okay. okay. Um, what's important here? Okay, so uh, <clears throat> our cerebral cortex covers <laughs> Uh, mostly, you know, it covers the, the, the surface of our brain. That's, that's why our, the tops of our heads are larger than other mammals, largely because we have an ex a hypertrophied cerebral cortex. And um, the reason it's called a cortex, and once again, I, the only reason I say this because, is because it helps me remember things. Cortex is, is the surface, and cortex is Latin for bark, and the surface of a tree. So that's what covers the surface of your, uh, of your brain, the outer surface of it. Um, in the um, parietal areas, there are two, er two, uh, two uh, um, parts that control the, uh, your nerves. They, they send uh, signals to the periphery and then receive sensory signals back from the periphery. And the, the, the part that sends signals to the periphery is the motor area. And the, the part that receives signals back from the periphery is the sensory area. And it's located right across your, the, 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 in this uh, parietal region of your, of your brain, underneath the parietal bones. The reason that I mention that, so um, I'll come back to that. So we have this motor cortex. Let's talk about a nerve impulse that's getting to the periphery. The motor cortex of the brain, right here, passes down the spinal cord. And on the spinal cord, depending on where the muscle is, it passes out of the roots. Remember these little um, uh, the, the, these foramen on the side that, that, that allow the roots, the nerve roots, to pass out of the spinal cord into the periphery. It passes out the root, and they, those are called efferent nerves because they pass away from the spinal cord to the to the periphery, and they enervate skeletal muscles. We get feedback, sensory feedback, proprioceptive feedback from the periphery via afferent nerves. So afferent nerves go from the periphery to the, the spinal cord, to the spinal cord, and back to the brain to the sensory area. Now, we have very, very different allocation of resources, let's put it that way, to different parts of our body. Uh, this is, and, and this is represented, in, represented by what are called homunculi. Homunculus is singular. <coughs> homunculus just means little man. 
Okay, that's all. That's all that means. And it's a medieval term. Uh, it was once thought that, uh, uh, well, they had they had homunculi doing all sorts of things in their body that were so small we couldn't see them. Uh, so, but that, once again, it's medieval. But we retained it because a sensory homunculus shows the relative allocation of of a, a, a cortical tissue to that part of the body. So we are much more sensitive in our hands and in our face, in particular mouth. Uh, we have much better supply of nervous tissue. It's, it's pretty traditional to, to portray them two-dimensionally like this because this shows what part of the brain from, you know, from the inferior to the um, to, to the uh, superior sagittal area uh, is, is um, devoted to each part of the body. I ran into this a few years ago because it's the first three-dimensional one I've ever seen. I thought it was pretty cool. Uh, so think about it. You know, if you get if you get a you know a tiny splinter underneath your fingernail, it, it feels like a you know like a log under there. But if you get a, a splinter in your back. Well, it's not comfortable, but it doesn't feel as bad as one that's under your fingernail. And that's because the sensory, uh, the amount of uh, cortical area that we, can, that we uh, allocate to our hands, and also to our mouth and, and our tongue, uh, largely because we manipulate the world with our hands and because we, uh, we speak. And we have to have a lot of feedback from the parts of our body that have to do with speech. Likewise, this is a sensory homunculus. Likewise, there is a motor homunculus, for which the hands are even huger, right? uh, and the mouth, and the face. I mean, that, is, that, that, that takes a huge portion of our, uh, of our resources in our brains, because we are so oriented to manipulating the outside world with our hands. And because we require so much um, uh, uh, control of movement in order to produce language, because we have a lot of a lot of muscles associated with that. Not to mention the fact that our face is a, a major source of present presentation of uh, of communication. In addition to language, your face is extremely important in communicating. As you know, you can communicate without saying a word, and that's and we allocate a lot of a lot of our cortical area to doing that. <clears throat> so I showed you this once before. Okay, this is a uh, a cross section of uh, of the spinal cord. Cross section of the spinal cord, the dorsal root, in other words, posterior. That's where the afferent nerves are. And I, and I realize that these, these uh, arrows cause a lot of confusion. The arrows are simply pointing to what's named. Afferent nerves actually move away from the spinal cord. Those are the motor nerves. And they leave by the dorsal root. Okay. The ventral root, anterior, is where you have the efferent nerves, the sensory nerves, uh, coming into the nervous system. Don't worry too much about the commissural neuron or the intermensal neurons. Those are just, um, you don't need to know this. <laughs> I'll just say that. But be aware of the afferent and efferent nerve roots. So main thing to know is the efferent and Right, right. So what we have here is a, the efferent nerve root uh, passing uh, into uh, in, into the uh, spinal cord. Efferent is the, I hope I didn't say this backwards. Efferent is the outgoing. Afferent is incoming because that's add x. That's that's the root. X is outgoing. Afferent is incoming because outgoing is the ventral. And that's where the motor, uh, the motor uh, neurons pass the muscle. And I hope I didn't say that backwards. No. Okay. I said, I said okay, thank you. Yeah, James. Uh, incoming to brain. 
uh, yeah, afferent is incoming to the spinal cord and therefore incoming to the brain. Efferent is outgoing. In other words, that's the, that's the, those are the motor nerves. And, and that's what this depicts. The ventral efferent motor neurons. There are two types of reflexes. Um, <clears throat> I will, uh, the, one is a stretch reflex, which you all know about, and also uh, a flexor reflex. A flexor reflex is what you do when you, as it's depicted here, touch something hot, touch something sharp, touch something painful. Okay? We have the stimulation going into the uh, dorsal nerve root, passes to the brain and, um, and, and, and sort of simultaneously passes to the flexor muscles. Okay. So it's handling the brain. I'm sorry? The flat part is the brain? Is that the brain? Uh, this, the uh, no, this is, this is a cross-section of spinal cord. Okay. This, is, this shows that it's going, it's going, it's going, going to the brain. Okay. The point is, is, despite the fact that this is extremely quick and we don't generally think about it very much when we have ex encounter something painful, we do, it does involve the, uh, the brain. Okay? It does involve the brain and the reflex. That's called a flexor reflex. What does not include the brain is the stretch reflex. That's why when you go to the doctor and they hit your knee with a rubber hammer and your knee and your leg pops up. Okay? Never involves your brain. Because what's happening is that they were causing a reflex arc by shortening the tendon, the patellar tendon. And that's what the rubber rubber mallet does when they when they pop your knee, they are artificially shortening the patellar tendon. And that tell without any input from your brain, that tells the vastus, uh, the quadriceps, let's put it that way, since the vastus muscles and the, uh, uh, the rectus femoris all uh, insert on the patellar tendon, that causes those muscles to contract. And that's an immediate reflex arc, and we'll talk about it in a little bit, which is the result of what's called a Golgi tendon organ. The tendon organ is, is sensitive to uh, stretch reflex and it never involves your brain. It goes to your spinal cord and right back out okay, without, ever, without ever thinking about it. You have no, I suppose what you could do is tighten your leg and, and if, you, if you do a, uh, a voluntary flexion of both the, uh, of both the, 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 rec, the, um, uh, back, the uh, quadriceps muscles and the biceps femoris, if you tighten it enough, you could overcome that stretch reflex. But you still might involve. It still might try to, to uh, to, to flex the, the quadriceps. Uh, so what this does is it is it enters the spinal cord via the uh, the dorsal root, and then the ventral root sends uh, sends out a message to contract the muscle, as without sending a, 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 a message to the brain. And we'll talk about the Golgi tendon organs uh, in a little bit. And by the way, that's Golgi tendon organ. A, I believe, uh, Italian biologist, because he was a lot of things named after him. There are Golgi bodies and cells and things like that. Apparatus is one. Yeah, Golgi apparatus, yep. <laughs> Okay, <clears throat> this is a typical nerve cell. I happen to be depicting a motor cell which has um, a, a motor nerve, I'm sorry, which interfaces with the, with the muscle. Uh, at one end, we have what's called the motor end plate. Then along the length of the, uh, of the cell is, uh, is, the, is, an, is called the axon. And the axon is covered with a, um, a fatty tissue called myelin. Okay? 
Uh, myelin is like insulation in a wire because our, set, our, our, our nerves transmit electrical impulses. And the, the, so the, the myelin is very like the, the uh, insulation on a wire to keep it uh, from, um, to protect it and to keep it uh, transmitting electrical impulses without interference. Now along the length of the axon, we have what are referred to as uh, nodes of Rainier. The nodes of Rainier, the, and those are separated. Those are involved, but don't worry about the Schwann cells. I decided, I decided that that was an excess com complication, but do know nodes, nodes of Rainier. Of demyelinization that are involved in transmission of the nerve impulse. And this is a normal demyelination and not like a disease right. process. Okay. That's right. Because you're right, there's pathological demyelinization. And usually people lose motor control when that happens. Um, the, the nucleus of, of, of a nerve cell um, is surrounded by, uh, by uh, dendrites, which are involved in, uh, in transmitting it from, from the previous nerve cell. Uh, but that's not too important for us. Right? Yeah, James. Did you mention the importance of the nodes of right here? Uh, yeah, they're involved in, in transmission of the nerve impulse. We'll talk about it a little bit. In nerve conduction, the, the, um, the mechanism <coughs> is referred to as the sodium potassium pump. Sodium potassium pump because at rest, and if this helps, great. If this doesn't, just pay attention to what I have up here. Right, I think this helps. At rest, sodium ions are outside and potassium ions are inside. The resting potential of a nerve cell is negative, around say, negative 70 millivolts. As the potential begins passing down the nerve, there is a greater exchange of sodium and potassium ions, so that eventually the inside of the cell has more sodium and the outside of the cell has more potassium so that you get a positive charge inside the cell. This is called depolarization. And then as the nerve impulse passes, it returns to steady state, which is negative inside at 70 millivolts. Okay? And it's, it's, it's a progressive process like this, and it's cyclical. What's important is that at the nodes of Vernier, where the demyelinization takes place, is where the depolarization takes place. So it's responsible for the propagation of the nerve impulse. It's responsible for the propagation of the depolarization wave as, as the uh, uh, as, as the nerve impulse is passed along the nerve cell, along the axon. Um, this, again, if it helps, great. If it doesn't, don't worry about it. This is the, there's a threshold because uh, 70 millivolts is the resting potential. It has to get to negative 60 millivolts before the nerve impulse uh, before the full depolarization takes place, there's some um, leeway, for lack of a better term, before it reaches a threshold and full depolarization occurs. And then, then, then there's the, the repolarization. So it's a refract, it's a, the resting period, the refractory period, and then the afterwards the depolarization is the relative refractory period. But you don't have to know those periods. I, like I said, I just. I thought that this might help to illustrate the idea. Okay, before I move on, sodium potassium pump. Does this make sense? Need help? Can we repeat it? So you said that you don't need to know these steps. Do we need to know these steps? Well, these steps are important. What's important is the 
depolarization and repolarization of the propagation of the nerve impulse and the exchange of sodium potassium ions. Oh. Right. So Savannah, good question. I just want to clarify to make sure this right. So the can you talk the image is the outside the bottom left side correct? Right. Okay. So the depolarization of of occurs in the canals or renia or whatever. So that's that's where the exchange occurs. Yeah. That's where the exchange occurs. Yeah. That's depolarization. The, line. Yeah, and it allows depolarization. So what about repolarization? Repolarization is a natural resting state. Uh, okay. But it, when when there is no other input, it returns to the repolarized state of negative inside, positive outside. Is that when it pump closes stuff? Um, it doesn't so much close as it's not stimulated to depolarize. Uh, it's not it's just it's no, there's no longer a stimulation, so everything drifts back to its resting okay. state. Oh, uh, okay. But, does that help? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, James. So the potassium, it doesn't look like it, the potassium ever moves outside, though, correct? It's only the sodium moving in. Or yeah, is that? that's really not true. That's why. That's why I said that this doesn't help. It does. Okay. Yeah. So it is. So there is an the, 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 the the exchange. Yeah, yeah. there is an exchange. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I, I use this because I like the idea of it showing that the depolarization, reaching threshold, then and depolarization, then repolarizing. But the fact that the, they never show any, actually, I know they don't. They never show any of the potassium outside. I don't know why they don't do that. <laughs> It's from RT and uh, they're usually pretty good, but every once in a while there's something that I can't explain on it. <coughs> Is it significant that the purple gate has double doors and the <laughs> that's what's throwing me off. Yeah. VIP. Like I said, <laughs> if it's if the VIP area, you gotta get through both. There's bouncer on each side. Watch out. <laughs> Yeah, okay. I think I might take this illustration. <laughs> okay, so maybe I should just ignore this. Yeah, if it doesn't, like what I said, if it doesn't help, ignore it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, this is the part that isn't worth it. Other questions about my idiotic illustration? Well, an idiotic illustration that I copied. <laughs> okay. Let's keep going then. Two uh, uh, pain receptors, or proprioceptors, I should say, that we're going to talk about is the muscle spindle and the Golgi tendon organ. Muscle spindle is a proprioceptive sense organ that's actually located within the fibers of the, uh, of the muscle. Okay. It's embedded in the muscle. It is sensitive to the amount of stretch in the muscle, the, amount, the length of the muscle. Um, so it gives feedback to the central nervous system via the sensory afferent fiber of how much force to exert. That's how you know that I don't have to exert much force to lift this, but if I want to lift this desk, I'm going to have to lift, exert a lot more. Because even without looking at it and judging it, even though from experience, if, I, if you, you look at it, you, um, you can judge it, but nevertheless, you still have to go up and as you're lifting it, modulate the amount of the number of muscle fibers recruited in order to do that. The muscle spindle is a way to help you do that, to either recruit through, it has both positive and negative feedback, to, to recruit more muscle fibers, Recruit fewer muscle fibers. Um, this is part of the uh, patellar reflex because this is a stretch of the patellar tendon, which tells you to continue to, because it's stretching the, um, the muscle spindle and it causes the, 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 um, uh, enough muscle fibers to fire to extend your leg when you strike that, that patellar tendon, that sense of stretch. So you, you, it looks at the final length and it looks at the rate of change. And it modulates it has both, both positive and negative feedback. In contrast, the Golgi tendon organ is only an inhibitor. It's a negative feedback. 
as the name implies, it's an organ that's located in the tendon. Not in, it's not integrated into the muscle fibers the way the muscle spindle is. The tendon organ, Golgi tendon organ, is an inhibitor to prevent injury. It causes failure of the muscle. It causes the failure. It causes the muscle to stop exerting uh, um, force when it reaches a threshold level. Um, so, when you go to lift something, you're straining, you're straining, you're straining. Finally, your muscle fails and you drop it. You're arm wrestling. The arm wrestling is based on whose Golgi tendon organ fails first. Because what do you do? You struggle back and forth until finally one of the, somebody's Golgi tendon organ fails and they lose. Right. It's a way to prevent injury. It's a, it's a negative inhibitor, or that's redundant. It's an inhibitor that causes the muscle to stop exerting force uh, when it exceeds a certain um, threshold. Okay, so, so yeah. Sure, exhaust is different than exhaustion then. Different exhaustion, yeah. Yeah, this is the, this, usually in a, in a situation where you use the Golgi, where the Golgi tendon organ causes muscle failure, you're usually not exhausted. You're just exerting too much force. Is that it? So, is this all, so how, can we help use the Golgi tendons effects then in order to get more of our muscles still and exceed their limit, so to speak? Is that sort of what happens when you go to the gym and you're doing reps, so to speak? Kind of, kind of. Remember, uh, I, uh, Mason asked me that and I said that one of the things that you're doing is that you are um, increasing the tensile strength of the connective tissues. And the tendons are one of them, so kind of. What you're doing is you're increasing your threshold. Okay, what is, you know, somebody that is a, an Olympic power lifter has a much higher threshold for the Golgi tendon organ to cause muscle failure than any of us in here does, presumably. So, yeah, kind of. Okay, here's this fun diagram again. What's, what's important from this part of it is I'm trying to, I'm trying to go from the uh, from the uh, gross anatomy to the micro anatomy level. So we have muscle, and muscles are divided into muscle fascicles. And this is, this is the hierarchy. Muscle fascicles, then, are divided into muscle fibers. Muscle fibers are divided into myofibrils. There's that prefix again, myo. And the myofibrils are, uh, are composed of myofilaments. A couple of things here. Muscle fiber. Is, is, is unit of contraction, so to speak, because a motor unit the abbreviated MU is a muscle fiber, that's what MF stands for, is a muscle fiber, and uh, the, no, I should say this the other way is a motor neuron in all of the muscle fibers it animates. What is the MF? Okay. So muscle a unit of contraction is a motor unit. Motor neuron and all of the muscle fibers that it innervates. Right. Myofilaments are the unit, are the smallest unit of contractile elements. Uh, the 
automatism? Motor neuron? Motor neuron, yes. Okay. That's, and uh, as we'll see here in a bit, those, those uh, uh, contractile elements are thin filaments. I'll abbreviate that thin, or FILA, and thick filaments. The thick filament is myosin. Thin filaments are troponin, tropomycin, and actin. And these are on another slide. I'm just giving you a preview. I wanted to put, I wanted to put it in the context of the of the hierarchy. Contract, uh, contractile elements. Now, if you'll notice, what this is blown up is each one of these are the myofibril. Okay, the myofibril is this group of contractile elements. Amongst bundles of myofibrils, we have, it is um, supplied with calcium by this net-like structure called the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Okay. And remember I said um, sarcoplasm is cytoplasm is kind of like the, uh, the is, is the analog of the cytoplasm of the generalized cell. Cytoplasm is the is the part of the cell where the you know all the, the, the organelles float around in and inside there is a nucleus. Sarcoplasm is simply the, the uh, cytoplasm of a muscle cell. So the sarcoplasmic reticulum is a net-like structure in the cytoplasm of a muscle cell. And it supplies calcium ions. For the purpose of muscle contraction. Uh, that's septoplasm then? Sarcoplasmic reticulum supplies calcium ions. And this is sarcoplasmic reticulum. Believe it or not, maybe I should rewrite that. That's pretty bad even for me. That's the, um, the very bottom part of the left end, correct? There's the sarcoma. Uh, sarcoplasmic reticulum is this. Yeah, the reticulum is the left structure, the web left structure. Yeah, this is. This is just more detail. I thought it was a kind of an interesting picture, but it's more detail of this. Sarcoplasmic reticulum, the Z lines. Okay. So imagine let me try something. I have met with some success with this. On, just like everything in um, in um, there is a um, a, a plethora of um, YouTube videos on the um, uh, sliding filament theory of muscle contraction. So let's see if I can find one. I've seen a couple of them.
Uh, also trying to crawl. <laughs> Professor is trying to crawl. Uh, Go on the bottom where it says search. Yeah, click on that. And then it's uh, Chrome. Okay. I, I, I never use Explorers. Yeah, then. I'll, I'll try that. You're so smart, man. You can actually type on that bar with the Chrome. I'm just trying to get rid of this crap. It seems to go on forever. <laughs> Ow. Wow. That was so hard. So let's see. Side note 3 animation. Let's try that. And the, the, the sound is not particularly important. What is important is the is the, the, the animation that they have in it. And this is what the thick film looks like microscopically, just so, just in case you're curious. What's the holes? Uh, they're, yeah, here we go. What, what do you mean, with, which holes? Um, it looked like there were holes of yellow stuff coming out, I don't know. Oh, those are the, um, uh, the, those are the myosin heads. Oh, okay. What we were talking about in a minute. So anyway, what, what this is is a, is a three-dimensional illustration of the myofibrils. These are the Z-bands, the Tzishin Shaiva, and that helps you remember it, I thought it does. <laughs> 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 What's that? The I-A-H. Yeah, yeah. And this is, the, um, this is the thin filament, which consists, the thin filament ironically consists of troponin, tropomyosin, and actin, three different molecules. Whereas the thick filament with these myosin heads only consists of myosin. This is pretty much stationary. What happens is a chemical reaction causes these to slide across the thick filament and it draws the Z-bands together. At the gross level, then a muscle contracts. So the, the animation is what I think is kind of cool with this. So let's try that again. And that's a, actually a pretty good animation, I think, of, what, uh, of the uh, uh, chemical interaction and then the, 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 the uh, heads of the, of the uh, thick filament drawing the Z-bands together to, to cause muscle contraction. And that these are the myosin, this is the myosin, myosin heads, and there's our, our ADP and inorganic phosphate and ATP, which uh, causes, which gives us the energy for this to contract. Then go, go too far here, but, and then calcium ions. That's what the set is. See these these little things that are floating out there, even though they're not labeled, are calcium ions. That's why the sarcoplasmic reticulum stores calcium. It releases calcium into the the, the myofilaments, and that draws the, the, the thick filament heads, and then the, the heads swivel to cause contraction by the, by by ATP uh, when, when it breaks down. The yeah. other part of it, I presume, yeah. is the fifth thing. Yeah. 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 So music by Kevin McLeod, I didn't hear the music. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> as as I didn't let you hear music. Yeah. <laughs> so, music. Anyway, yeah, I didn't music. want to say music. <laughs> so that's a theory? Is that correct? It's just actually, a theory? Actually, that's a, that's a really good point. Let's, let's, let's delve into the philosophy of science a little bit. <laughs> In common, in common everyday language, when we talk about a theory, we talk about something that's hypothetical. That's, but in, when you're talking about philosophy of science, that's not true. 
What we talk about as a theory is actually an hypothesis. In philosophy of science, when you talk about a theory, it's something that is fairly well established, subject to change and, and revision, but still established. So that's pretty well understood. So it's it's always somewhat of a of a um, miscommunication when they call things theories, because everybody has the common uh, the common language definition of theory in mind, and it's not true, because it's far more established than an hypothesis. So anyway, there's the tropomycin, troponin, and actin on the thin filament, the Z-band, which is sort of the anchor for the thin filaments, and then the, the, the thick filament and the myosin heads, which form cross, or what are called cross bridges, which draw the zeolites together when they contract. What we're going to be talking about, and what I will do is go through it today, and I think we'll probably stop with that. But I guarantee that it probably yeah, we should probably start next week by talking about it again, because it's it's not the most transparent process. Let's put it that way. If you guys have ever studied um, biochemical reactions, you know that there there's nothing intuitive about them. So I'm just just warning you. Okay, this is a large blow up of a motor end plane. This is, this is a motor neuron. Uh, this is a node of Bernier. Uh, this is the myelin sheet, okay? And this is the motor end plane, where, the, where the, the motor neuron ends, and it doesn't actually attach, but let's say it interfaces with the muscle, okay? Where there is a gap between the motor end plate and muscle is referred to as a synaptic cleft, uh, sometimes a postsynaptic cleft. Synaptic cleft. Synaptic cleft. Is that a synaptic vesicle? Uh, it's not a synaptic vesicle, it's a synaptic cleft. And I'm sure it's here somewhere. Let's see if I can find it. It's all on the bottom. Second one. Synaptic cleft, thank you. Right there. Synaptic cleft. What does it mean, though? Well, it's just, it's the gap between the motor end plate and the muscle itself. They don't actually touch each other, but that's so microscopic that for all intents and purposes they do. Okay. So we have by the sodium potassium pump that sends the, 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 uh, the, the, the nerve impulse along the length of the axon. It hits the motor end plate then it begins an entire new process in the muscle to cause contraction. So it has to send a neurotransmitter across the synaptic cleft to receptors on the muscle cell. The neurotransmitter is acetylcholine. Left side of Acetylcholine receptor site. Can you see that? Acetylcholine receptor site. Acetylcholine receptor site. There we go. That's a C. And it's, and it's abbreviated a you know, CH. Acetylcholine. What is it? Uh, it's a neurotransmitter. Neurotransmitter. If we write ACH, that's fine, right? That's acceptable. Um, yes. I'll, I'll say yes because. <laughs> The reason I say yes is because I get tired of, spell of reading the spellings after a while. So yes, it's a neurotransmitter. The crazy way people spell these words. <laughs> oh, you have no idea. <laughs> okay, <clears throat> and there are receptor sites on the um, uh, on the, the muscle. Uh, Sarcolemma. I think I think sarcolemma is here. Um, oh yes, sarcolemma right here. Yeah, I can't read it after all. Sarcolemma is the uh, is the, the the cell the muscle cell membrane. It has a receptor sites for acetylcholine. So what happens is 
we have this motor end plate that receives the, um, the um, impulse, the, the nerve impulse. It causes the release of acetylcholine into the synaptic cleft. It crosses the synaptic cleft, and then there are receptors on the sarcolemma, on the muscle cell membrane, for acetylcholine. Those receptors then cause another sodium potassium reaction along the sarco sarcolemma that's just like the nerve cell. It's a depolarization wave along the sarcolemma. That de depolarization wave causes a calcium release from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. That's why we talked about the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And that sarcoplasmic reticulum releases calcium into the muscle fibers. Remember in, in the animation, there was all those little white uh, balls that were going into the, the, the filaments? That's what the calcium ions are. The calcium ions draw the, the, uh, the uh, uh, cause a um, cross bridge to form. So that's the term that's used, a cross bridge, which is essentially an attachment between the myosin head and the thin filament. Then that stimulates the ATP reaction and it causes the thick filament myosin head to swivel, draws the Z-bands together. And that's what causes the tension production at the gross anatomical level. Okay, now I'll go back. That was the, that was the, I'll go back and recap it. Um, <laughs> did you say good? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so acetylcholinesterase in, the, in the, the synaptic cleft is an enzyme. Whenever you see ASE at the end of a, at the end of a, of a word, it's an enzyme. What, the, what the, that enzyme does is it breaks down acetylcholine so that it doesn't continue to cause the muscle to contract. There are a variety of poisons that attack acetylcholine and acetylcholinesterase, causing, uh, causing um, um, paralysis, because that's a very common way to cause paralysis. Um, so here, recap, as I promised. Here we have the electrical impulse. Uh, and this, is the, this is the motor end plate again. This is the motor neuron. This is the synaptic uh, cleft. And this is the uh, sarcolemma. So again, sodium potassium pump causes the release of acetylcholine. And it does a lot more. Just concentrate on acetylcholine for release. Pat crosses the synaptic cleft to the sarcolemma. Where, where there are receptors, that causes another sodium potassium uh, depolarization wave along the sarcolemma. Um, oh, here's where I put in the little thing that I thought was kind of interesting. Uh, botulin, which is botulism, kills us because it causes paralysis and it blocks acetylcholine release. That's how it kills us. Uh, in small doses, tell me, what does it do? <laughs> Botox. <laughs> it causes, <laughs> that's all it does, is it, it, cause, it causes, uh, it causes a um, um, paralysis of the little muscles in your face so the wrinkles go away so you look younger for a while. So what you're doing is you're, uh, you're injecting yourself with a botulin uh, uh, bacterium that causes something really bad in larger doses. And that's botulinum bacterium is, uh, develops in, um, in uh, rotted foods. Spoiled foods can have botulinum, botulinum so, bacterium. So when you get the botulism, does that come from That's there? from botulinum it's bacterium. That's exactly right. Botulism from spoiled food. Yeah. The other one is, is um, uh, curare. Curare is, blocks the receptors on the, on the, synaptic, uh, the postsynaptic membrane, sometimes called the synaptic uh, cleft, or the uh, sarcolemma blocks those receptors so that you can't, uh, so that you can't contract, it causes paralysis. Um, in South America, a lot of natives there use that for hunting. They put it on darts. Um, but also another tidbit is that curare, at least at one time, was used uh, 
in, um, in, in operations in the, in the OR. I did a project, an ergonomics project in an operating room a number of years ago. And uh, so I sat in on a bunch of operations. They were interesting. Um, but I followed a, a, an anesthesiologist around. Because not only do they, an anesthesiologist administer anesthesia, they also must administer a paralytic. Because you can be anesthetized, still move around in, the, in your sleep. And it's obviously not desirable. So what they do is they administer an, a, 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 a paralytic as well as an anesthetic. Curare is the paralytic that they use. Okay? It can be, people can die from too much of it. That's why people die under anesthesia sometimes. It's usually not from the anesthetic, it's from the paralytic that they die. And that's also why they intubate you when you go into general, under general anesthesia. That they breathe for you. Because you're paralyzed. You can't breathe. <laughs> you, you die without the intubation. Um, so when you're paralyzed, you cannot breathe? No. So because because it's a voluntary, it's a, it's a muscular reaction. Uh, it's a, a striated muscle to die from. It's voluntary. So, um, but in some cases, there have been instances where one wears off before the other. Now, if if the curare wear, if the paralytic wears off first, they just administer more because you're still anesthetized. What you really have to worry about is when the anesthesia wears off and the paralytic doesn't. And I know that that happens because I knew someone who, to whom that happened to. And he was conscious through most of an appendectomy oh. and unable to move. I mean, it's like your worst nightmare. Uh, but what they did is they administered too much paralytic and insufficient anesthetic during the operation. I don't think that happens too much anymore, but we don't hear about it unless you know somebody that it happens to. Yes, How do they, so if that happens, how do you track the, like, I don't know that they do. <laughs> that's what I'm saying, because yeah. going through that, you're, you're experiencing the pain of this thing. Yeah, you do, because you don't, the anesthetic is insufficient, but the paralytic is. And you can't signal that anything's wrong. I, I would that. guess. I would think I, the heart rate would go up, That's, though, that's exactly what I always thought, because yeah. your heart rate, your blood pressure, mm -hmm. it has to do with monitoring. And that was one of the problems that, 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 in, that the anesthesiologists face is because they have to work on the patient at the beginning and at the end of the operation. They have to administer the paralytic, they have to administer the anesthetic, and they have to intubate and monitor the patient, give them injections and all sorts of things. Then they sit there for the duration of the operation. Okay? And in the, oper in the operating rooms that I was in, there was a bank of, of um, monitors that the, 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 the patients here, the bank of monitors is behind the, the anesthesiologist. So he was turning, most of the time during the operation he was like this, or else he was reading. <laughs> that was the other thing, they got bored. They're sitting there for two hours, the guy's not doing anything, so he reads or does something else. You know, torments the ergonomist that's in the, in, in the room with him, whatever, whatever entertains him. Uh, but they can't lose a lot of concentration because it's extremely boring because they have to be there. Uh, so that's how things like that can happen. Uh, pesticides uh, are usually acetylcholinesterase inhibitors. In other words, they allow the release and, and receptors for acetylcholine, but they don't allow the breakdown. So you continue contraction until you reach tetanus, which is an inability to stop contracting. And that, that eventually causes death as well. But anyway, these are just a couple of things, that, a couple of ways you can interrupt the process of muscle contraction by attacking the neurotransmitter or the neuro, or the acetylcholinesterase, which breaks down the neurotransmitter. Okay. So, the previous picture, I showed you the motor end plate, the synaptic cleft, and then the sarcolemma, and, and then the, the, uh, the transmission of the sodium potassium <coughs> impulse along the sarco sarcolemma. In cross-section, the sarcoplasmic reticulum has three structures. It has a transverse tubule, and to either side of it is a cistern. So it has a transverse tubule and two cisterns. The cisterns are what contain the calcium ions. The transverse tubule is a way to admit the, the uh, sodium-potassium impulse into 
the, and along those systems, because in the presence of the uh, of a depolarization wave, they re release calcium into the um, into the, the myofilaments. So you said the, the cisterns have the transverse ions, but what, what did you say that the middle the transverse tubular? Uh, the, the transverse tubule and two cisterns are the components of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Let's go back and, and, and look at the larger picture. Here, the sarcoplasmic reticulum. This is the, the transverse tubule, the, the purple. These are the cisterns. And the cisterns have a network through the um, uh, myofibrils, the myofilaments, because they want to have as much release of calcium ions into those myofilaments as possible, because those are what stimulate the attraction of the, of the, of the, the uh, thick myosin heads for the thin filament. This is kind of a, a question. Yeah. Are we going all the way to the end? No. Okay. To the end. 60 slides. Never ends. <laughs> <laughs> there, there is no end. That's right. There is no end. <laughs> That's right. I just keep following it all. <laughs> <laughs> I actually had a student one time that, that, that ginned up a, um, a cartoon that he found. It was something, it, it, it was, it, it was a, you know, a, um, a demon with a pitchfork and there were all these people trudging into hell. And it was a, a, it said the, the, you know, the endless economic seminar and he wrote over it, the endless, the endless ergonomics lecture. <laughs> I still have it somewhere, I'll have to show it to you guys. <laughs> so, anyway, I thought you'd appreciate that. Actually, the comment on it. Uh, no, I'm going to qu quit after I finish muscle contraction, then I'll pick it up next week and we'll talk about it a little bit more. Um, <clears throat> so this is kind of a, a, uh, um, uh, this is kind of a, a synopsis. It shows in detail what, we, what I showed you in the, the uh, um, what I showed you in the um, video. And, you know, just go uh, on, on to, um, and do a search on sliding filament theory and you can watch all the videos you want if you want to look at it again. Uh, but uh, this is at rest, uncharged, atypic cross bridges, actinomyosin uncoupled. In other words, there's no, there's, there's no chemical attraction between these two filaments. And calcium is, stored, is in the sarcoplasmic particulum. And then during excitation coupling is when the calcium ions draw the, um, um, the myosin head towards the thin filament with, and it has ATP present. ATP breaks down, causes the swivel of the head, draws the Z-bands together, and at the gross level you have muscle contraction. And then during relaxation, it, just, it simply goes back to this resting state. Okay, so yeah, we have about, we have 31 more slides, which I will do next week. Um, as I said, I still haven't decided, I haven't figured out. For you guys, it will be on Tuesday evening, the 27th at six o'clock, the review session. So what I'm going to do next week, I, I'm finished for today, and, and, and then well, I'll take questions. But I just want to tell you what my what the, the, the schedule is. Uh, so next week. I will finish this lecture, this topic. On the exam, we'll have topics one, two, and three. Two and three, obviously, are much larger than one, but take a look at one if you want. Please don't ignore it. Um, uh, then, uh, in two weeks, to be the exam, you'll have an entire three hours to do it. I'm going to try to write it so it doesn't take you three hours, but you have three hours to do it. Um, then, but that's the 28th, so that means the evening of the 27th, the night before, at 6 o'clock here, I'll hold a review session. And I prefer not to stay until 10 o'clock, but I, I do, will stay until you don't have any more questions. Let's put it that way. So right after your other class. Right, right after ergonomic, because, or epidemiology, because there's an epidemiology 
as some of you know, was an epidemiology exam the day before. Um, so um, uh, I will be in that between three and six. You have questions? Yes, he does. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, questions? Oh, on the 26th. It's on the You don't need to know this chart, right? Yeah. Um, I wouldn't, I don't know about the chart, but you do need to know the process. Uh, you will need to know the steps. Uh, the question was, do you need to know the chart? Well, I don't know about the chart, but what I would expect you to be able to do is tell me the steps of, of the sliding filament theory from when uh, the uh, nerve impulse reaches the motor end plate until contraction occurs. Okay, that, that I would expect you to know. However you provide that, however you learn it best, is up to you. The steps, are these the steps? Some of them. That's some of the steps. That's some of the steps. But is there it's a not page a... that has all the steps? Nope. You had to listen to me. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's, that's the rub. You got to listen to me. <laughs> the good thing is on uh, video, man. Oh, yeah. And I will go over it again before I get started with the rest of the lecture next week. Just listen to it in your sleep. I'm sorry? So just listen to the videos in your sleep. I don't know if that works or not. <laughs> <laughs> it might just give you nightmares. Yeah. Wake up in the middle of the night, hear my voice. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> He's following me. <laughs> uh, other questions? Okay, I think you guys are, are, are done for today. Thank you. I will see you next week. <laughs>